And on this day, our first reading, the Old Testament reading, is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 13 to 18. Where God assures us that he will never leave nor abandon us, that he will take care of us just as a mother cares for her child. Listen to these words. Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Let mountains burst forth with shouts of joy, because the Lord is comforting his people, and he is showing mercy to his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has abandoned me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not show mercy to the son from her womb? Even if these women could forget, I will never forget you. Look, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are never out of my sight. Your children are hurrying back. Those who destroyed and devastated you will depart from you. Lift up your eyes all around and see. All of them are gathered. They are coming to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, all of them are like jewelry that you will put on. You will wear them like a bride. This is the word of the Lord. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, beautiful text how Paul knew that the Lord would take care of his needs as an apostle even if at times he ran out of the basic necessities to live on and how the Lord will take care of us Paul writes I rejoice greatly in the Lord now that you've revived your concern for me once again actually you were concerned but you had no opportunity to show it I'm not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation while being full or hungry while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you did well by becoming partners with me in my affliction. You Philippians know that in the beginning of your experience with the gospel, when I left Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Even while I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once for my needs. Not that I'm seeking a gift, but I'm seeking the fruit that adds to your account. I've been paid in full, and I have more than enough. I am fully supplied since I have received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you, a sweet-smelling fragrance, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will fully supply your every need according to his glorious riches In Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. And then finally from the Gospel of Matthew. In the Sermon on the Mount, as we continue our series, The Upside Down Kingdom. This will serve as the basis for our message. The true wealth and riches that we have in Christ's reign. Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. Do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourselves in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, that is, wealth. For this reason I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more? Than they. Which of you can add a single moment to his lifespan by worrying? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. But I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not clothe? you even more, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the unbelievers chase after all these things. Certainly your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father God, we give thanks and praise to you for the truth of Holy Scripture. Oh, speak to us. Speak to our hearts, Lord, that your spirit would have free course in this place. Just draw us to you. Wherever we're at in our lives, in your name we pray. Amen. Each and every single one of us in here, in fact, each and every single human being on planet Earth is searching, is looking for something that will make them happy, that will satisfy them, that will fill them up. What is your heart looking for? What is your heart seeking? For many people, it could be just to get more money. Get more money, better job, be more prosperous, bigger house. Story of one man who indicated that that was what he was seeking as the goal of his life. His name was Reuben Klamer. In his obituary, you'd think that's what his whole life was for. Died September 14th, 2021 at the age of 99. Well, who is Reuben Klamer? He was the creator of the board game, the Game of Life. Now, it's interesting. There was a story about it. You know, when the Game of Life was introduced in 1960, the purpose of the game was what? Get the most money. Earn the most wealth. I played Monopoly growing up. Tracy and her family, they liked to play life Um, so I was introduced to it later but yeah it's to get more stuff the way you get there was simple enough by going to college getting a job buying insurance saving for retirement and an old Hasbro vice president said and when it came out that was the truth of the times that that's the way things worked but over time the designers of the game realized well you know it's really not matching you know, what people are longing and seeking for anymore, life goals have kind of changed. So they gave it a big update in 2007, allowing players to score points for virtuous deeds, like, listen to this, saving an endangered species, opening a health food chain. I missed this edition of the game. And uh, also the points for recycling. And instead of starting the game at point A and finishing at point B, Z, there's no fixed path in the game. Now, that would frustrate me. You decide how you want to spend your time in the game. And so one question that popped up, well, if the popular view of what matters in life, what people are seeking and longing for, has changed in the last, you know, in less than 50 years, who's to say it won't shift again in the next 50? 
How, what will you be seeking as your goal in life in 2057? Well, as, as someone wrote, the, you know, the redesign teams when they were working on the game, they had a hard time addressing a fundamental criticism of the game of life, and it was this. The only way to reward a player for virtuous acts was money. <laughs> more money. As if the whole goal in life is to get more money. And so save an endangered species, collect $200,000. Solution to pollution, $250,000. Open a health food chain, you get $100,000. And so, now these last comments I find very interesting. And so in 2007, when they overhauled the Game of Life, titled The Game of Life, Twists and Turns, it was almost an existential redo. As it was put, instead of putting players on a fixed path, it provided multiple ways to start out in life, but nowhere to finish. There's no finish point. Quote, this is actually the game's selling point. It has no goal because life is aimless. That's where we're at today. There's no final goal in life. There's no purpose. There's no end point. So the whole point of the game of life is to seek and long for whatever momentary happiness you can get to fulfill the desires and emotions of your heart. Because there is no overarching goal or end point. It's just start wherever and just try to grab enough happiness. Long look for whatever will satisfy your desires. But as followers of Jesus, we're, on a com- we're playing a completely different game. The Jesus who has called us to follow him and to live under his rule and reign has called us into an upside-down kingdom whose values is totally contrary to that of the world. That people may be thinking they're playing the game of life and there's no end point, there's no goal, and it's merely for your own happiness, your own prosperity. Jesus calls us to an eternal purpose. He calls us with an end point, a goal in mind. That we find our highest joy and happiness in his rule and reign. In fact, he calls us, contrary to the ways of the world, to be kingdom seekers first. You know, that's really what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Life in the kingdom of God. And now we come to a really often called the sermon within the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is describing what it means to be a kingdom seeker first. And and you boil the whole gospel reading down, and you can boil it down to this one verse, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now, once again, it's not seeking a place. It's seeking the rule and reign of God that he would take the driver's seat of our heart. He would run and rule our lives to seek his reign and his righteousness, that he would put our lives right, that he would put other people's lives right, that he would put the world right, that first and foremost, as Jesus calls us to follow him with a company of Jesus followers, he calls us to seek and pursue his rule and reign first and foremost in our lives. Now, now it doesn't mean, okay, check, I handle that first, and then I move on to other things. It's not like, well, I've got a pie cut in so many pieces, so I'll eat this piece first, and I'll go into the other pieces. No, it's that it is first and foremost as central to your whole life. It covers the whole pie. And everything we do, all we long and seek is in Jesus as king. So what does this mean for us? Well, Jesus uses three metaphors to describe what it means to be kingdom seekers first. And the first picture or metaphor is that of treasure. Treasure. You know, when Jesus says, do not store up treasure for yourselves on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Okay, now Jesus isn't saying here, Now, you can't have any personal possessions, uh, or you can't have a bank account where you're storing up money. He's not saying that. 
Because actually, the disciples, they had a treasurer. They had one who kept the money bag. And because they had expenses that they had to pay, it was Judas who was the treasurer. And there were some wealthy women that were funding them in his itinerant ministry. And so it doesn't mean you can't have possessions, that you can't accumulate money or buy a new car or house. But, and we're always reminded these things are going to rust and break down. We got our daughter, Michaela, who turned 16. She's got a 2008 Hyundai now. And there's some rust on it. A, a reminder that, you know, these things are going to rust and break down and fall apart. And they're temporary. The whole point is, these earthly things are not our treasure. That word treasure means what you value the highest in your life. What is of the highest worth and value in your life? And Jesus says, whatever you do, don't let your treasure be the things here on this earth. That's not your treasure. And, and he says, because moth and rust are going to destroy them. Thieves are going to break in and steal them. Maybe you've had a car or something valuable stolen. He goes, that's the way it goes. Don't let that be the treasure of your heart. He says, but store up treasures for yourselves in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Treasures in heaven. What is that? Storing up treasures in heaven. Now, that's something I've wrestled with for many years. And, you know, I've heard those that say, well, you know, it deals with, you know, as we do good works, you know, serving others with the, on the response to the love of Jesus, you know, we're storing up our good works in heaven. And it's like, you know, that's part of it, but that's not the whole picture. Actually, if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, that word treasure, how Jesus uses it, he defines what he means. Because if you were to look in Matthew 13, verse 44, he's telling these parables, and at one point he defines it. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. That when someone discovers it, they're like, for the joy of finding that treasure. They sell everything to buy the field and have it. And Jesus is saying, the greatest treasure is to know the rule and reign of Jesus in our hearts and lives. It is to know God through Jesus Christ. That is the greatest treasure of all. That he would rule and reign in our hearts and lives. To know God through Jesus Christ. And that means as we seek to know him more. As we seek him to reign in our hot lives more and more. It's like we're storing up and accumulating the treasure of his rule and reign. Not as some physical earthly thing that you, know, you can see and touch and, and put away in a bank account or put in a treasure chest. But it is knowing God in Christ. Knowing his rule and reign. Knowing his grace and his compassion and his mercy in such a way that we're storing this up. In heaven, in God's heavenly presence, knowing that one day that's our destination. That we're, we're going to come into this treasure, this inheritance in God's heavenly presence. And it's being stored up now. His rule and reign. So it's interesting, also in Matthew 13, verse 52, he talks about the Bible scholars, the scribes who have become followers of Jesus, who are under the reign of heaven. He said, they're... Like people who out of the treasure or the treasury of the scriptures bring out both old things and now new things. The teachings of Jesus. So right there he's saying the Bible, the scriptures are like a treasury holding treasure and the treasure in it is God's word. God's word to know him, to have his rule and reign in our hearts and lives. So. Jesus is saying, I want you to store up, collect, get more and more of that knowledge of God. Get more and more of his rule and reign in your heart and life. Get more and more of the knowledge of God by being and digging into the scriptures, into the word of God. And then the final text that defines what that treasure is, is chapter 19, verse 21. Where wealthy young man, Jesus says, Come follow me. He says, sell everything you have. He says, sell everything you have. Come follow me. Uh, give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And right there, Jesus is saying, it's also 
how we live in the rule and reign of Jesus. And as we seek to know him more and more and seek to grab a hold of that and accumulate that knowledge of God and, and digging into the scriptures and having him rule and reign in our lives more and more. It's like laying up treasure in heaven. And then it's reflected in how we live, that we serve and love and bless other people. And Jesus is saying, all of that, either intangible, invisible, spiritual treasures that we're storing up in his heavenly presence that one day we're going to come into this wealth in his presence. Jesus says, let this be your treasure. He says, because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you value more than anything else in your life? That's where your heart is at. Is your treasure the rule and reign of God and Jesus, his word, and living a life that reflects him to serve others? If that's your treasure, that's where your heart is at. But whatever you treasure, that's where your heart will be. So treasure. And the second is seeing with the eyes of faith. Jesus used the image of the eye and what it sees and allowing the kingdom of heaven to shine its light within us. And Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Now, we don't think in terms like that. For them, it's like, you know, it's like you got these two lamps in your head and they, they kind of had this picture. And for us, it's kind of a weird physiological understanding. You know, it shone light outwards and that illuminated the world. And then it would also shine light inside of you. And you be able to receive that light and see what's outside. And so the image is if you have unhealthy, bad eyes, you know, you're not going to see very well and it's going to be dark. But if you have healthy eyes, the light that is shown from those lamps of your eye, it's going to flood your whole body with light. And Jesus is using this as a, a metaphor, spiritually speaking. He says, you know, if you're focused on the things of this world... Your eyes will be bad and there will be a darkness in you that you will be longing and searching for all the wrong things in the darkness and it will never satisfy you. But when the rule and reign of heaven in Jesus is what we see with the eyes of faith, that everywhere we go, everywhere we live, it is to see with the eyes of faith Jesus ruling and reigning in our lives, through us, in our midst. He says it will fill you with light. And then finally, Jesus says, treasure? What do you treasure? What are you looking for and looking at? It will either fill you with darkness or light. And finally, whatever that is that you're seeking or looking for, it's what you will serve. Because Jesus then says, no one can serve two masters. Well, you know, the train tracks here diverge, and the trains either got to go to the right or the left. And they talk and first century and ancient literature that, you know, household servants or slaves, you know, didn't work out too well to try to have two masters. You either have to serve one or the other. And it's the same with our lives. Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You're going to either hate the one, love the other, despise the one, or be devoted to the other. He says, you cannot serve both God and, and then Jesus doesn't use a Greek word here. He uses an Aramaic word. That would have been foreign even to the Greek speakers, except the Jews. Mammon. And the King James uses that in this translation here too. What is mammon? It's like a personification, like an idol. And it means wealth, money, possessions, the stuff of life, as if it's an idol that you're bowing down to and worshiping. Probably the closest equivalent is when we talk about the almighty dollar. It's like, man, they worship the almighty dollar. You know, that's a personification of money as if it's an idol that we bow down to. And Jesus says, you can't do that. You can't serve two masters. You're either serving God with your life or you are serving money, wealth, possessions, anything you can accumulate on this earth as if it's an idol and you're bowing down to it. You're serving it. Not God. And here's where Jesus holds up a magnifying glass. Excuse me, he holds up a mirror. Holds up a mirror to us to take a look and realize where have we been tempted to serve 
the agendas of this world to put first our pleasures, our desires, money, wealth, possessions, rather than God. Yeah, it's so easy for American Christians, hey, even with economic troubles, you know, that we're facing and may face even more, we still have more stuff than pretty much anyone else on planet Earth. And it's so easy for us to become like the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation. Yeah, as we, in the Revelation class, have gone through those churches where, you know, they were materially very wealthy. But Jesus said, you're neither hot nor cold. You're not, you don't have a passionate seeking of me and my kingdom. You're just going through the motions and you show up to church and you do your thing and yet you're living for your money, your wealth, your lifestyle, your pleasure. And unfortunately, that's true of many of us as American Christians. And we're all tempted in that way. In the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, I'm going to... I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'd rather you be hot or cold. And so Jesus holds up that mirror for us to take a long, hard look. And you hear in the Sermon on the Mount when he gives these really bold, strong statements, always has to be understood. It's like it goes back to that first beatitude. It always returns us to that first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because there is the, is the kingdom of heaven. That we can't perfectly serve God. We can't be fully dedicated and committed to God like we should. And in so many ways, we cling to the things of this world. In so many ways, we do find our treasure and our highest value and worth in, in what we do or what we accomplish or what we own. And, and it always returns us back to this first beatitude of being, realizing we're enslaved to sin, that we're broken in so many ways. The poverty and bankruptcy of spirit and realizing we can't just serve God in our own strength and power because we in our sinful flesh grasp a hold of the things of this earth. And so Jesus reminds us that he graciously gives us the true happiness the true joy, the blessedness of his heavenly reign. Because he came from heaven to earth to free us, to forgive us from our self-centeredness, our turned inwardness, our slavery to the things of this world, and our serving of the flesh and the powers of darkness. That Jesus laid down his life. That he who had the wealth of heaven, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he who is rich became poor, going to the cross, giving his life for our sin and rising from the dead so that we may be set free to know that he forgives us. And when we know that poverty, when we know our slavery to sin, when we know that we're broken people, that he comes and he graciously forgives us. He graciously releases us. He frees us. He says, I now rule and reign grace and mercy as we just receive it by faith so that he gives us the greatest treasure of all himself you know Paul touches on this in a way that it's interesting he ties together treasure light and service this is in 2 Corinthians 4 5 to 7 he says for the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Christ. He shines that light through the gospel that I have freed you, I have forgiven you. And then he says, we hold this treasure. In other words, the greatest treasure you are given by God in Christ is to know him by his grace grace who forgives you who loves you who's redeemed you and restored you to the heavenly father he says we hold this treasure in clay jars these flimsy broken flawed broken sinful bodies we're given the greatest treasure to know of god's redeeming love and grace and then paul earlier had said it's not about ourselves 
We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. He gives us the greatest treasure, which is himself. And in that, and you see, it, we're always in the posture of receiving what he gives, which is how the Sermon on the Mount is to be read. And if you read it apart from the Beatitudes, then you're like, oh, I can't do that. Exactly. Reset. He gives it to those who are broken, sinful, empty, impoverished in spirit. And he gives his rule and reign by grace through the gospel and baptism and the Lord's Supper. He richly blesses us. And he frees us so that all the cares and concerns of this world don't need to consume us. Because the Father has lavished his love on us at the cost of his son, we don't need to be anxiously consumed with our daily needs. Our Father will take care of us. Now, Jesus says here some of the most beautiful words in the New Testament. For this reason I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now, this isn't a command, like a club, like, you better stop worrying, pound, pound, pound. Stop it. It's an invitation. You don't need to worry. You've been set free. Now, this doesn't mean, oh, well, I don't have to have any concern or attention to paying my bills or, you know, getting new clothes. Or It's like, well, no, that, that's not true either. He's, Jesus isn't talking about that. It's like, no, we do have to give a daily attention and concern to, you know, we got to pay for bills and we got to get groceries and food and pay the mortgage on the house. And, you know, those are things that are the daily necessities of life, just like Jesus and the disciples had to do. So he's not talking about the daily attention to paying bills and basic necessities. The word worry here refers to a worry and an anxiety that would so overwhelm us that we're afraid of the future. That's what he's speaking about. You don't need to be consumed with worry and anxiety in a way that you're afraid. You don't need to be afraid of the future. Because Jesus frees us to know you have a loving Heavenly Father that's going to take care of you. He's like, you don't need to be overly consumed and anxious and afraid about what you're going to eat or drink or about your body, what you're going to wear. He's like, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And the answer is, I almost think you have a confidence or identity issue here. If you don't think you're worth more than birds... Let's try it again. Are you worth more than the birds? Yes, because God sent his son. You're worth his lifeblood. He bought and paid for you. And if he died for you, as Paul says in Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things along with him? And then Jesus goes on to say, you can't add a single moment to your life by being consumed with worry and anxiety. So why worry? He says, you don't need to be consumed with a fearful, consuming, soul-crushing anxiety or worry. He says, look at the flowers of the field, how God makes them beautiful. He says, even more so than Solomon. So do not worry, saying, what will you eat, or what will you drink, or what will you wear? For the unbelievers chase after all these things. Notice that. Those in the darkness, that's what they're seeking. That's what they're chasing after with fear and anxiety, and it's consuming their hearts. And Jesus says, you're free of that. It doesn't have to paralyze you. It doesn't have to consume you. Certainly your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Just drink that in. He knows. He cares for your life. All the little details, your finances, your house, your health issues, all of it. And he says, I'll take care of you. 
Maybe not always in the way that we would prefer or that we like. Just like Paul says, yeah, I know what it's like to be lacking and also to have more than enough. But I can be content in all circumstances. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And so he freezes to be kingdom seekers first. We are free to be kingdom seekers first who desire God's reign and righteousness in Jesus to be at work in us and through our lives. He calls us to be a people, a group of Jesus followers who, who know our highest treasure to be in Jesus, who desire the light of his kingdom in us and to be serving God in Christ in such a way that the world knows, you know what, there's no greater treasure than in Jesus. That's why Jesus says, after saying, the Father knows you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because he's claimed you, he's made you his own. And now he who gives us his spirit, the forgiveness and the grace and the hope of eternal life in his heavenly presence, he now prompts from us by his spirit to seek his reign in our lives first and foremost in all that we do. His righteousness that we who've been put right with God, that our lives would continue to be healed and put right. That other people's lives would be put right. That God's righteousness, his saving plan would be advanced in the world. And you know what? All these other things... They'll be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> Truer words were never spoken. It's like, why in the world would you want to get worry from tomorrow for today? So he calls us to be a community of Jesus' followers that seeks the heavenly reign of King Jesus more than anything else. And you know what? And, and people will notice that. It will catch people off guard and go, what is it about you? I just want to share in closing here a story about brilliant, smart, intelligent MIT professor who thought she had it all in her knowledge and intellect, Rosalind Picard. In grade school, she was a straight-A student. She said, I identified with being smart. That's what she accumulated. That was what her treasure was. She said, I believe smart people didn't need religion. And as a result, I declared myself an atheist and dismissed people who believed in God as uneducated. But then God started to bring people in her, lives, her life that were kingdom seekers, and she had a hard time explaining it. In high school, I babysat to earn money, and one of my favorite families was... A young couple, and both the husband, who was a doctor, and the wife were just like really sharp, really smart. And one night, after paying me, they started to share their faith in Jesus. And they invited me to church. I was stunned. People this smart actually went to church? Does that mean we're all stupid? When Sunday morning came around, I told them, oh, I've got a stomach ache. I don't want to go. So they tried a different they said, well, you know, the most important thing is what you believe, what you're seeking in life. Have you ever read the Bible? Uh, no, not really. I gave her a Bible and said, you know what, start with Proverbs. Just to my surprise, Proverbs was full of wisdom, and I had to pause while reading and think. And I read through the entire Bible, and I got this strange sense God was speaking to me. I was, like I was being spoken to, and I was wondering, there must be a God. Well, during my freshman year in college, I reconnected with a friend who was a straight-A student, star on both the basketball court and football field. I'd never known anyone so smart and athletic, and then he shared his faith in Jesus. And he invited me to his church. I'm like, what in the world is with these people? And so she went. So the pastor got my attention when he asked, who is the Lord of your life? Who is your master? I was intrigued. I was the captain of my ship. But was it possible that God would actually be willing to lead me? So in the spirit of Pascal's wager, I decided to run an experiment, believing I had much to gain but very little to lose. 
After praying, Jesus Christ, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I put my faith and trust. I took a step of faith in him. And she says, my world changed dramatically. It was as if a flat black and white existence suddenly turned full color and three-dimensional. I felt joy and freedom from the burdens and cares of life, but I felt this heightened sense of responsibility and challenge. Now I'm dedicated to Jesus along with all these other Jesus followers. She says, today I'm a professor at a top university, MIT, in my field. I work closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles, people whose children are not healthy. I don't have adequate answers to explain all their suffering, but I know that there is a heavenly father, a God of unfathomable greatness, love, and mercy and compassion who freely inter enters into a relationship with all who confess their sins and trust in his name. This woman discovered the greatest treasure of life was not her intellect. The light of the gospel shone in her, and she knew the greatest treasure was Jesus, and she began serving him. And may he do that in us, to know his kingdom reign, that we may be kingdom seekers first. Amen?